Hello. In this video, we are going to talk about uh, the high frequency response of transistor amplifiers. I have redrawn um, the, the body plot for the magnitude response of um, an amplifier, uh, where we can see again that there is a midband region over which the magnitude of the amplifier gain remains uh, um, approximately constant. And then uh, we mentioned that at low frequencies, that, uh, that gain starts decreasing due to coupling and bypass capacitors, but also at high gains, it starts decreasing, and that is due to uh, internal transistor capacitances, uh, load capacitances, as well as parasitic capacitances. So this is due to internal transistor capacitances, load capacitances, um, stray capacitances, etc. So in this video, we're going to explore how those play a role. Um, again, we're going to learn how to determine uh, the high cutoff frequency, FH, uh, based on the effects of the different capacitances. We can observe just from the plot that those capacitances are going to form a low-pass type of, low-pass filter type of effect. And so we will see that they actually form low-pass filters with the resistors connected across their terminals. Um, there is going to be, by definition, the um, high cutoff frequency is going to be the minus 3 dB point or the frequency at which the amplitude of the, of the amplifier gain has decreased by a magnitude of 3 dB. So it's 3 dB lower than its value in the mid-band region. All right, uh, so let's go ahead and start exploring uh, those different effects. As far as the transistor, the internal transistor capacitances, we can uh, represent those as follows. In the case of a BJT, we have collector, emitter, and base terminals. And we can represent those, uh, those internal capacitances as follows, there is one capacitance from base to collector, which I'm going to label CBC. And there is one from base to emitter, which I'm gonna label as CBE. And these are the two most important ones that are going to be playing a role in determining that high frequency uh, response. Um, the terms CBC and CBE they're not a uh, very standard terminology. Uh, if you look at the textbook or you look at the data sheet, they typically don't appear expressed as that. Uh, you will oftentimes see CBC, the base to collector uh, junction capacitance represented as COBO. That will be the case, for example, of um, the 2N3904. I'm gonna put that example somewhere. So example, is just a general purpose BJT, BN transistor. Um, so it will be represented as COBO, whereas the base to emitter capacitance is represented as CIBO. Um, and if you look at the data sheet, they will have values of four picofarads in the case of the 2N3904, uh, four picofarads for uh, COBO and eight picofarads for CIBO. And when you look at most uh, textbooks and, and papers and things like that, they will refer to um, CBC as C mu and CBE as C pi. And that terminology just comes from uh, the capacitances that are included in the high frequency hybrid pi model for the BJT transistor. You may be wondering what? There is a high frequency hybrid pi model. Uh, there is. There's actually the same uh, hybrid pi model that we have been using, except now it takes into account these uh, internal capacitances. And so it's just a small modification. We can redraw it here. Our new hybrid pi uh, high frequency model. 
And first I'm going to start with the standard model, um, and then I'm just gonna add those capacitances so that you see that it's actually very simple. So our standard model had a resistor from base to emitter, our pi, and then from collector to emitter, we have a current source, which is GMV pi, or beta IV, IV being the current flowing into the base, V pi being just the voltage across that R pi resistor. And then we had little arrow. This is collector, that is base, and this is emitter. Now, we just need to include those capacitances. So we see that a C mu appears between base and collector. And so we can just include a capacitance C mu from base to collector, as well as C pi appearing between base and emitter. So basically in shunt with R pi. Now, sometimes you will see a more complex uh, high frequency hybrid pi model. Uh, for example, sometimes you will see a resistor Rx connected to the base um, or a resistor um, connected in parallel with C pi, uh, sorry, with C mu. Um, and, you know, we're not going to be using that. We're just going to be using this simpler approximation. The reason for that is that um, those resistors are typically very small, so they're not going to dominate. Uh, the high frequency response of our amplifiers. So we'll just leave it like this, just considering those two internal capacitances, and we'll see how to deal with them. Uh, other capacitances, as we mentioned, that may appear is if we have our amplifier, let's say we're taking the output out of the collector. This is our output. And let's imagine that this is connected to some kind of load, uh, which could be simply the, um, the input stage of... Uh, or the input resistance of uh, a subsequent stage for the amplifier. And we're typically going to represent that. We've been representing it with a resistor, as a resistive load. The most correct way of representing um, a load will be considering its resistive component, RL, but also its capacitive component, CL. And so in that case, any load capacitance is going to have um, an effect in the high frequency response of our amplifier. And then there are stray capacitances uh, due to the wires, connections, etc., which we typically will also connect in parallel with CL here. Now, um, in most cases, those are very small compared to CL um, or even the other capacitances. So we're just going to play and ignore them in our analysis from now on. Um, and then there is something else that will affect the high frequency response of transistor amplifiers, and that is what's known as the Miller effect. Now, what is the Miller effect? Uh, well, as we can see, there are these capacitances between base and collector, between base and emitter. Um, oftentimes, we'll find a situation where we will see the capacitance, one of these internal capacitances, connected um, across a feedback loop, meaning from the input to the output of our circuit. If you look at this figure right here, you can see that if you have a common emitter amplifier, for example, you have uh, your input applied to the base, your output taken at the collector, and so you have this CVC capacitance, which is basically connected in a feedback path from input to output, or between input and output. Um, and so we're going to see what happens when we encounter capacitors connected like that um, between input and output. And what happens is what's known as the Miller effect. Let's imagine that you have an amplifier, just generally speaking, um, with a gain A. I'm going to make this an inverting amplifier. And now let's imagine that I have a capacitive element connected between input and output. So I'm going to call this the feedback capacitor, or C sub F. That's V in, that's V out. Um, basically, John Miller, uh, who was the first person that published um, about this effect, discovered that um, the behavior of this capacitor uh, across the feedback path is as if you had two shunt capacitances, one at the input, one at the output. So basically, this circuit behaves equivalent 
to a circuit with an amplifier, same amplifier, having two capacitances, uh, which I'm going to call CME and CM out. Uh, CM standing for C Miller or Miller capacitance, and so these are basically Miller capacitance at the input, Miller capacitance at the output. Um, and so it behaves as if you had two shunt capacitances of the following values. C Miller input will be equal to CF 1 minus A, and C Miller output will be equal to CF 1 minus 1 over A. Now those are the generic formulas and uh, normally you consider A to be uh, the value of the gain. Here I've represented negative A, um, so it's going to mess up my equation. So I'm actually going to just represent this as A with the understanding that A in this case is a negative number because this is an inverting amplifier. So I'm just going to call this inverting amplifier and inverting amplifier. So for example, let's say that the gain of my amplifier was negative 100. Example, A equals negative 100. What I will see is that my similar input will be equal to CF multiplied times 1 minus negative 100, which is basically 1 plus 100. And my similar output will be equal to CF multiplied times 1 minus um, 1 over negative 100 or 1 plus 1 over 100. And so we can see basically that this is approximately equal to 100 CF and this is approximately equal to CF. So basically for an amplifier uh, of a certain gain, what has happened is that if we connect a capacitor across the feedback path from input to output, uh, it behaves as if we had two capacitors, one at the input of, um, of a value equal to the feedback capacitor multiplied times the gain of the amplifier, and one at the output of value equal to the feedback capacitor. Um, as you can see, this is going to have a substantial effect in our frequency response because we're, um, we're now seeing a capacitor that is uh, the gain times the value of that feedback capacitor. So even if you have a very small capacitor, let's imagine CVC, the internal capacitance of my transistor, as we previously saw, is in the order of 4 picofarads. Now, if I have a high gain amplifier, let's say with a gain of 100, I'm multiplying that capacitor times that gain. And so uh, the Miller effect is going to uh, limit uh, the frequency response or limit the high frequency for those amplifiers, especially the ones that have high gain, as we're going to see. Um, so let me write a little note to that effect. So, um, this is called the Miller effect. And I'm going to say this multiplicative effect will impact the frequency response of high gain amplifiers. All right, and then finally, um, the way we are going to calculate our high cutoff frequency is going to be very similar to what we did with the low cutoff frequency. We're going to calculate the high cutoff frequency due to each one of, of the capacitances individually based on the value of the capacitance and the thevenin resistance connected across the terminals of that capacitor while we uh, neglect the effects of the other capacitors. And that's going to give us different values for uh, high cutoff frequencies. One for CBC, let's imagine, you know, this will be um, 
FH1, FH2, FH3. And my gain, or the magnitude of my gain, as a function of frequency. Basically, I'm representing now, uh, zooming into the, um, the high pass, or the high band portion there. What I will have is when I encounter my first pole, I'm going to start decreasing at a rate of negative 20 dB per decade. As soon as I hit my second pole, that's gonna increase to negative 40 dB per decade. And once I hit my third pole, it's gonna become even sharper. That's just the piecewise linear approximation. My actual curve is going to appear a little smoother than that. And we're going to um, approximate our high cutoff frequency uh, by assuming that the lowest of the high cutoff frequencies is going to dominate, is going to be dominant. And so for FH1 being much smaller than FH2, FH3, etc., we can assume that the overall high cutoff frequency is going to be approximately equal to FH1. Thank you.